What's happening, everybody? This is Alex Osterley, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Food Marketing Nerds. When we're talking competitive landscapes, most industries have something in common. You've got a few big fish with huge marketing budgets, and then you have the challengers, waking up each day looking for innovative ways to compete for the same customers in the same market. Some challengers lean on creative marketing, some invent unique business models, others are absolute fanatics about building customer relationships. Today's guest, Kim Bartley, is the CMO for a company that happens to have mastered all three of those things. Yep, we are talking about White Castle. In today's interview with Kim, you're going to learn how White Castle uses data to thrive in a market full of brands with huge ad budgets, what it really takes for marketing leadership to build a raving fan base, and of course, I had to ask how the movie Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle influenced their sales. I think you guys are really going to enjoy what Kim has to say, so let's go on and get after it. Welcome to the Food Marketing Nerds Podcast, where we talk marketing, branding, and social media with the smartest minds in the business. Here's your host, Alex Osterley. Kim, thanks so much for joining us on Food Marketing Nerds. It's exciting to be on the uh, show with you. So can you tell the our, our listeners kind of how you, you got into your role and, and uh, your history with White Castle? Sure. Uh, the Cliff Notes version of it would be I went to uh, an undergraduate school that had a major in communications, and uh, I did a couple of internships, one that ended up in an ad agency, and as they say, the rest is history. Uh, graduating through that program, I ended up uh, having a client called McDonald's early in my life. It was my uh, second job and uh, learned an awful lot about consumers through that experience and how franchise systems work and fell in love with the franchisees, fell in love with marketing to consumers. And then moved around um, various restaurant chains, including some entrepreneurships here in Columbus, Ohio, as well as working with uh, Rack's Restaurants, which is no longer around. And I worked with General Mills Restaurants, including um, Olive Garden, which you're all familiar with, I'm sure. So um, then I ended up here at White Castle. Very nice. And so White Castle isn't isn't doesn't have the same franchise model as, as McDonald's, does it? No, we do not franchise, which is um, there's a big difference between franchising systems and publicly held companies, which General Mills was um, when they had their restaurant group, which is Darden now. Um, and so I had a lot of experience with it and exposure to both those types of systems. And then coming over to White Castle, we are family owned. Uh, 95 years old this year, and very different environment because we do not franchise and are family owned, um, which is what makes part of what makes it special and why I've been here 27 years. And I, I think it speaks highly of, of White Castle that you guys are in a, a really competitive industry with some massive players like you've got the McDonald's and the Burger Kings of the world who just have a an endless budget. It seems like. How do you compete aside from having just a different voice? Well, we work very hard at looking at our competition through the lens of not trying to imitate them and looking at who our customer is and then trying to say, can we outsmart them? We're small but mighty. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that, that it's the approach that we take that we don't, we're, we're trying to be different we're trying to be true to our brand and not get distracted by the, the shiny objects. We work very hard at trying to see what can we do differently and in a way that is unique for us and branded for us that still stays on top of the trends. And if there are occasions when we just can't do it, then we just say no. We can't be that um, and, and stay true to it. We have our own, um, you know, we have our visions and our values and our, and, and our, our campaign themes that we work around, but we really spend a lot of time saying what's true and what's, what's core to us and how do we maximize that and, um, so that the competition has barriers to it. Um, we can't create barriers to everything, but as much as we can, we try to be first and we try to be very different um, in order to create that success for us. And speaking of which, and kind of targeting, targeting a, a younger demographic you guys recently launched a series a video series called for the love of the slider so what was the what was the strategy behind that or can you just give the, the our audience a little bit of insight and in, into the strategy and and just the overall premise of that series sure um wow uh, so some of the insights around our customers are that if you if you go online you see a lot of our customers 
that um, create their own White Castle sliders. And we've had a lot of customers give us suggestions on new products. And one of the things that we observed about today's younger consumer is their love of food, or that I wouldn't be on the phone with you. <laughs> and this interview wouldn't matter. Very different in terms of the, how they engage with food and young chefs. So when we were talking to our, um, our agency made a recommendation that we um, combine some of those key elements and work with this property as a way of bringing to life that relationship in a different way. And so that's how we kind of approached it. And we're having a great time with it. I just saw the next one coming, and it's going to be great. It's fun. We like people to play with our food. We're not afraid, you know, that, the, you know, that our product has to be made exactly. Because if you come to our restaurants, we'll make our sandwiches any way you want them. I mean, it, if you want to combine different products, if you want to, you know, we're, all of our products are sold all day, 24 hours. I mean, we're, we're here to serve the customer. And so we figured some of our customers are chefs. They've eaten our product. They've grown up on our product. Sliders are popular on many, on many chefs' menu. So why not give them permission to have some fun? And I love the strategy. It's actually how we we thought to reach out to to White Castle. One of the reasons we thought to reach out to you guys is was seeing one of those videos come across on Facebook. Is there a way that you measure the effectiveness or gauge the results on that aside from engagement and and view count? We will use the standard measures of social media, but more importantly, our goal was to communicate the part of the brand is about having fun and playing with the food and really engage with the with food. That was more of the message that um, chefs can enjoy our product, and so can you, and you don't have to be a chef, but have it do it in a fun way. Um, our customers historically you know, uh, play with our food. I mean, there's, there's stories. Before, I, when I joined White Castle, one of the things where you learn very quickly coming to our brand is customers always have stories about a visit to a White Castle in their youth and how they grew up with the brand. And we know that as a late night, brand, um, a lot of that activity happened in the you know, early morning hours. But the, it was fun. It was people just enjoying being out with friends and family, and, and our team members in our castles do a phenomenal job of, in, of engaging with customers in that fun way. And uh, one of those fun ways was uh, somebody who worked with us and one of our, our business partners when he was youth, he had what he called pickle races. And, you know, they would see whether or not if they threw a pickle on a window, how fast it would fall down the window. Uh, not exactly something we are encouraging, and I probably shouldn't share that story, but the point is we allow our people to play with their food. We have a turkey stuffing recipe um, that we come out with every year, That's um, you know, which is people um, playing with you know the hamburgers and making new recipes. We have a recipe contest that goes with it, and um, it's it's a fun food. It's it fits into your life the way you want it to, and that's what you know. Part of our life is you know chefs having fun with it as well. And um, there are certain measures that won't come through in the standard way. I'll be evaluated, and the program will be tested, and uh, you know we'll, we'll check an ROI. But there, but what makes us special as a brand is is what I'll be looking for, and that is those relationship building opportunities. And I think it speaks a lot to the brand again about the fact that you place so much value on those relationships and and the opportunities to 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 further and build those relationships with your existing customers and find more cravers out there. So I've I've seen on on Facebook I see you guys have this this new Tangy Bistro slider that's kind of tying in with the with Thanksgiving and the, and the holidays. When you are launching a new product, just in general, how are you going about getting the word out there to make sure it's a successful launch? Uh, well, we use traditional media to, you know, broaden its reach um, as a way of competing. Um, but obviously, more and more of our dollars are going into digital and social communications. And then we look at, you know, at the, the restaurant level, standard communications pieces. So it's not an unusual way to go about it. I think what we try to do is look at the products as a way of having a life of their own and creating buzz around the actual product. So, for instance... There's a lot of right now attention being given to the t to the sides because the sides are different. You know, um, you've got our you know the green bean casserole version, White Castle a la White Castle, and you've got the sweet potato casserole a la White Castle. Um, we get try to get creative around 
what are the things that people will talk about because we're just putting a spin on it um, because the environment's going to be in a restaurant. Um, and so we ca- try to have fun as a way to create that word of mouth. Um, we're comfortable with the fact not everybody's going to like everything that we do, um, but we enjoy the fact that customers talk about us. And then in that talk, in that social media conversation, we can get the insights. I take all of the, on our website, anyone who wants to talk about new products at White Castle, likes, dislikes, improvements, you know, disappointments because we take something off that's an LTO, um, come to me. And then that's another example of how I can have fun with them and engage with them and learn from them, you know, and and commiserate with them when something I personally love comes off the menu. So right now, last year when we introduced the turkey sliders, we had one with cranberry sauce on it. So I'm getting customers now saying, I was looking forward to the turkey slider with the cranberry sauce. Where is it? And I said, I too wanted that on the menu, but but it wasn't the most popular item. And, you know, and I do have a, a... responsibility to the financials of the company. So um, so it's fun, you know, and, and I tell them, tell all your friends and I'll bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> so as CMO, you are, you're personally fielding and, and responding to the people's inquiries and, and suggestions about the menu? Yes. Wow. Yes, that's a, that's a, um, I had a personal frustration with um, websites that I could never find someone to talk to. And um, it was always going to a blank place. So when we redesigned our website a few years ago, we said that if you have an inquiry and here's what it's about, let this person know. And we call Let's Talk, it's called called Let's Talk Cravers. And depending on what it is you want to talk about, if you want to talk about a new site in real estate, you want to talk about products, you you want to talk about your likes or dislikes of our advertising, you want to talk about um, community relationships, all of that goes directly to someone responsible for it here in our home office. And we are obligated to respond to you within 24 hours, and um, in you know from a work week standpoint. So, and I have that's great fun for me. Um, and again, I get great suggestions, and I and great time for me to interact with people. And just looking at, I mean, that that's incredible customer service and a, and a really high standard to set. And it's uh, I, just looking through your your Facebook and seeing all these different delicious looking menu items. I'm, just curious, how, how come you guys haven't expanded outside of the Midwest? Well, um, we are in Las Vegas. I, I have to say that. Um, we have a licensee in, in Las Vegas, so um, which ha- creates a lot of buzz for the brand. Expansion for us, because we're family-owned and operated, um, and we don't franchise, means that we are careful. And then I would also say that you crave something you can't get. So the careful assessment on how to expand is what what we're working on right now is how do you carefully assess, you know, not becoming um, the brand on every street corner, but adding value to not just the brand, but obviously the revenue contribution to the company. The investment that a a company has to put into a new site is huge. Uh, A lot of consumers don't understand the the cost of opening up um, both from a real estate standpoint and, and a building standpoint. And so looking at that ROI becomes a critical part of, of the conversation. Um, we're not opposed to expanding, but we're very careful about it because it's a, it's a family business. And um, we're, we're, not, you know, we're not a franchise system and we're not a publicly held. So where that cash flow comes in order to fund it um, becomes important to evaluate. And we also have our retail brand, um, to consider along the, along with that, and we're we're going to be having some fun with that over the next several um, next year and beyond because um, you'll start to see some new products coming from our retail brand as well to kind of let everybody know that there's lots of great flavors coming out of White Castle. Well, that's really exciting, and uh, that is another another area of interest that I had just out of curiosity how the retail brand plays into the larger White Castle brand at, at large, it seems that your distribution for that is enormous. It's almost every every store that, I, that, I can, that I've been to over the past few weeks, it seems like. Yeah, we have a 95% plus distribution around all the grocery stores in the country. Uh, and it's our hamburgers and our cheeseburgers and, and our jalapeno cheeseburgers in various sizes of uh, configurations of packaging, depending on what you want to want to buy. And um, it's 30 years old, and it starts as everything does at White Castle, customer suggestions. A lot of customers were ordering a lot of large volumes of hamburgers to take out west where we didn't have restaurants. And um, our, our uh, former 
president and CEO who just retired, said, you know what? That sounds like a business opportunity. And um, and it was, and it is, and as they say, the rest is history. We are um, excited about that opportunity and continue to focus on it and um, uh, and want to bring more of it um, that's in our castles out to the consumers that are out there. So um, you'll see some more stuff happening there. That's exciting, and I'm sure we'll see some more promotions around that. Uh, in, in the future, I'm just out of curiosity. So I, I know on on social media, or I, I noticed on social media that it's it's pretty rare, if there if any, that you guys mention the retail brand. Is there a reason for that? No, it's it's um, it's not so much. It's rare. It's actually just evaluating um, the relationships right now. Uh, most of our customers are, are have more of a what I would call a relationship with the brand that's in the restaurants, um, and there's a lot of activity with the new products and things like that. Once the retail brand um, is doing a lot more of that and we can figure out that relationship and how people feel about it so we can talk to them um, through, that, through that channel, um, what we don't want to do is make it just about the advertising. That's easy. Uh, that's not us. Um, it's got to be about the conversation. So we're doing some research right now to see what should that conversation be um, and how do we bring that to life. Um, you know, I, you're right now, the, my assessment of the frozen category and groceries in general is there's not a lot of relationship with the products there unless the brand has has really worked on that relationship. And that's what we're going to be working on next year and the years beyond is how to create that relationship um, with consumers uh, in the same way we have that kind of relationship in the in the castle. That's great. And I, I have to ask, so the movie, mm-hmm. Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. <laughs> it's... Yeah. It feels like it's a, one of the staples of our of my generation, at least. Has that had a measurable impact on sales, or how how did that how did that transpire? Well, um, the two men that wrote it were uh, college students um, in and around where there were White Castles, and um, they wrote the script, uh, submitted it through the common channels to get movies produced, and then New Line Cinema picked it up. And uh, which was probably the more interesting part of the whole thing. And along the way, we had to give permission to parts of the script. And then at the end, we had to give permission to use our our name and any of our likenesses in the movie. Because, you know, my experience with most of the movies that we get approached about in terms of being, um, you know, in the movie, you know, on a table or, or whatever, a lot of things hit the cutting floor. So you, you never know whether or not you're actually going to be a part of it. This went all the way through and all the way up the channels inclu- to even include our name. So that turned this movie into a very different kind of experience in terms of revenue generating. If we had just been in the movie, um, not quite the same thing, but the amount of advertising to launch the movie in the theaters was incredible for us compared to what we, we would have spent on a budget in those cities. And it was easy because our name being in the title of the movie it, it was advertising. <laughs> so during the launch, um, we had some incredible increases in sales, and we did not have to invest a lot of our money in it at the time. So um, I always call it the highest return on investment we've ever had on advertising. We did a cup promotion uh, where we featured different scenes, and, and the, of course, our two Harold and Kumar characters. The actors are tremendous, and we love them both and have watched their careers very closely because generally whenever you bring them up, so does the name and as seen in uh, Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. And then anytime it airs on television, there's, there's a reaction. I can't say that we can attribute sales increases now, but at the time we could. It was a risk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's probably the best form of native, native advertising that, that I could ever think of. Yeah, I mean, it, it was very tied to a particular generation and of, of viewers of pictures. I think the, the challenge as a brand, because we crossed so many generations, um, we did have to field some comments from older customers who were a little surprised at the movie and how White Castle was in the movie, and so we did have to field some of that. But any, if I could get to someone in advance who was over the age of 65, I suggested that maybe it wasn't their kind of movie. <laughs> so trying to avoid having to respond to that. But in general, we've been very um, um, happy with the outcome of the relationship with the actors in the movie. Is that free free White Castle for life? <laughs> well, there's some you know the uh, the actors have just been um, 
you know, first of all, the the movie, I love their portrayal of their love for the product. And I, I had the opportunity through some of the um, premieres to meet them, and they're just great people. And we have maintained um, some relationships, particularly with Cal Penn. Again, I think that for us, the movie was more than just about advertising. Um, it, it's a love affair for the product. And I can't tell you, if, you lo- if you're looking at our Facebook page or you're looking at Twitter, uh, how many of our customers are out there making their own Sarah and Jane go to a White Castle trip. And um, it, it's, it's its own language with our customers. And, and that's not a surprise to me because so many people care. That's pretty amazing. And getting to meet the actors is a, is a nice perk of the job that I'm sure is unexpected. It was fun. I didn't think you're right. I didn't expect it. We had served, uh, it was in Austin, and I'd served uh, 10,000 hamburgers for the Austin premiere. And it was rather, it was uh, hot. Um, and being in Texas, I think it was like uh, about 100 degrees outside. Um, but we had a good time. Now, as a as a marketer and having seen all these different uh, d- different initiatives and and uh, worked with so many different agencies, I'm just curious, is there something in particular that you know now about your current role in the industry that you wish you'd known when you started your current position? I think the most important thing that I have learned over time that I encourage in my students, because since I teach, I, this is, I have time to reflect. I teach, try to teach the students that you're not alone, and that, especially in this industry, when so many cross, people cross between brands, there's always someone you can talk to to ask for advice. And to uh, stand alone um, and kind of talk to yourself as a, as a person who represents branding of, a, of, of restaurants that's probably the biggest mistake you can make instead of looking around and getting some help. There's always someone out there in this industry willing to help. Hmm, that's good. That is good advice, and it's unique to what most of our guests have said, so that's, that's great advice. And if I was to ask you more advice, we asked these, these same questions to these last couple questions to all of our guests. If I was looking to be more productive and I had you as a mentor, how, how do you go about being more productive and staying on top of what you do? Or what, what could our listeners do to, to be more productive, I guess? I generally give the advice with regard to don't try to do everything. Um, too many of us think that we have to compete with other people's lifestyles. So my advice is choose very carefully what you want to focus on and just focus on that. I can't be all things to all people, whether when I was, you know, as, you know I have my children, my last child is in college, um, and I had to find ways to make sure I focused on doing the best job I could as well, and that included being the best mom, being the best spouse. Uh, being the best person at work is the same way, can't do it all, so you have to learn how to focus and be the best you can be and then trust others to be the best they can be. That focus requires that you learn and use a lot of the social tools that are available to stay on top of what's new. So I will give you a very quick, I know I have to understand social media, um, so what I do is I use Flipboard as my aggregator app, take a lot of broad topics, and I read headlines. And then if I see a headline that relates to a topic, I share that article with the experts. I don't try to go deep. I don't, I don't have time for that. But I do try to stay up on uh, top of things broadly and then share with people what they may not have seen. And the most important part of that sharing is why I think it's relevant to us in terms of our current or future strategies. So it's, it's that perspective. I, I, can't go, I don't have time to go deep on anything these days but I do try to focus on what I'm paying attention to. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. So kind of triage in a way, dealing with the broad, most important things on your plate. So then last question. So I know I know you are a teacher and or a professor, and uh, I feel like marketing people in general have, have uh, at least one or two books out there that, that they've read that have influenced the way that they think. Is there any, are there any books out there that you've read that uh, really have shaped the way you approach your, your job or that you recommend to your students? Yes. Uh, from a marketing perspective, I think the, the book that probably transitioned me to a level of understanding how to compete is Blue Ocean Strategy. And there's several articles out there on there on, from um, Harvard Business Review as well. And they've updated it with some additional how to look at it, again, for people as well. But 
it's a very simple strategy in terms of how to think, and so it's easy to communicate. And that is, if everybody else is fighting for the same thing, and let's just take breakfast sales as an example, then that's the red ocean. That's where you, everything get, everybody gets bloody over there. So you want to look at the blue ocean. Where is everybody not playing that you can kind of swim around and enjoy and relax and be there and, and, and uh, have some fun with the waves? So there's more to it than that, but that strategy, very simplified, is when we get to a discussion, I look through that lens and say, are we playing in the blue ocean or are we playing in the red ocean? Because the red ocean as a small brand is very, very bloody if we try to go there. And that from a small brand standpoint, it's a great book. And I think that that speaks a lot to your leadership too, that you are practicing what you preach and really leveraging the principles in that book as a brand. And it's clearly paying off for, for White Castle. So far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so where if if someone's interested to learn more about White Castle who who doesn't already know all about you guys, where, where's a good place for, for them to go find out more about your, your upcoming product launches and, and uh, new LTOs? Our website has everything on it, you know, uh, at whitecastle.com. Um, and then, of course, we promote everything on Facebook and, you know, any you know, hashtag White Castle will also get you there. Um, we, have, uh, we have a lot of fun and, um, you know, it, uh, we're always looking for new ideas and new ways to think. And um, uh, we don't want to be like everybody else. So I, th- I think that uh, we're a great brand for people who want to experiment and try new things. So I invite anybody who wants to. Well, that's great. And thank you so much, Kim. It's, it's been a really insightful interview, and I really appreciate your time. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you all again so much for listening to the podcast. And if you guys are finding any value or enjoying what you're listening to, we would really appreciate if you could go over to iTunes and give us your honest feedback in the ratings and reviews section. It would really help us out. So thank you all again, and we'll look forward to talking to you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Food Marketing Nerds Podcast. For interview transcripts or to download your free social media ebook, check out foodmarketingnerds.com.